Hey everyone, back again today I'm going to start a two-part series on Oye Ronke Oye Wumi's The Invention of Women. But before jumping into it, hi I'm David, I explain philosophical concepts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. So if you're new here, you can see videos I release probably every couple of weeks. You could subscribe, won't that be fun? If you found this as a podcast, you can also find it on YouTube, hence my comment about subscribing. I, I, is that what you call it with the podcast? I don't know, I guess it is. If you found this as a podcast, you can sometimes find videos of stuff I do on YouTube. Maybe you're into that. Or if you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it just in audio on a podcast platform where there shouldn't be any ads. I'm Sometimes like ads sneak in. I don't know why it happens, uh, but there shouldn't be ads on any of the podcasts. You can just download it and put it on and listen. And you won't, you shouldn't have anything blaring in your ear like some random ad music. Uh, or that loud pitch in my voice. Uh, yeah, if you want to follow me in any other platforms, you can find links for such things in the, the description. If you want to help me out, liking, sharing, subscribing helps, getting the word out there. If you want to help me out monetarily, don't. Consider donating to one of the organizations listed below uh, to help Palestinians and Lebanese currently in need. And if you're interested in learning about Israel's apartheid regime, I've covered a number of texts uh, explaining this history from Edward Said to Nora Erekat to King Abdullah to Gilles Deleuze to others that I definitely recommend you go and listen to if you want to learn more about uh, what is currently happening in Gaza now in Lebanon because the, both of these things have a, have a long history. So definitely go and check that out if you're interested. So yeah, let us jump into uh, Oye Wumi's The Invention of Women, which is super interesting and important. So just quickly, this episode is going to cover chapters 1 and 2, and then uh, the next episode is going to cover chapters 3, 4, and 5, just so you know. And this text, I, I mean, i got to say it right off the bat, I am approaching this as somebody who is not from Yoruba land, or which is currently situated in what is known as Nigeria. I don't know this language. I don't know Yoruba. I'm not familiar with Yoruba land. I've never even been to, been to Nigeria. And so... You know, I have to preface this by saying that I can only give the most cursory presentation of what is going on here. You really have to read the book and read as much other stuff about the Yoruba as you can, which is what Oyewumi is really uh, inviting us to do. And for those that aren't, you know, actually <laughs> part of the Yoruba as well, can't just assume the, the, your, uh, Oyewumi's reader is not uh, Yoruba. But in any case, I can only give so much here because, you know, I'm just referring to my own uh, lack of knowledge about this. But in any case, I think I, I really want to highlight some of the really important insight she offers about the nature of gender, how gender is socially constructed. Let me put a little asterisk here saying that Oi Wumi really problematizes this idea of social construction. But in any case, to highlight the various ways that people and cultures have relationships and understand this thing called gender. So in chapter one, Oyewumi begins by uh, really highlighting the way that the West, the European West, embraces what she calls biologic and bio-reasoning, which is to say that in the West that there is a heavy emphasis upon bodies as being the determining factor in how people should exist socially and culturally in the world. So one of the ways that, the primary way that Oyumi will look at this is how gender differences that are ostensibly founded upon biological differences, but we're going to problematize that, founded upon biological differences are used to justify uh, assigning people different roles in the West. Whereas for Oyewumi, and that she identifies among the Yoruba, there isn't such emphasis upon gender in categorizing people and determining how they should exist in the world. Instead, there's a lot more reliance upon seniority, age, uh, familial lineages, uh, marriage unities, and so on, that play a much more important part than people's physical bodies in determining essentially how they're going to be socialized and then situated in the world, in society. Now, in the West, Biological differences are emphasized and used to justify distinguishing people. Even among social scientists, 
you know, like sociologists, psychologists, and, and everyone like that, who don't necessarily submit to the idea that biology is destiny. So for example, sociologists don't go and study something like gender or men or women or any other gender and says that people and say that people act this way because of their gender. Instead, they might say something like people are treated this way in this society because of their gender, even though such social scientists might be problematizing and moving away from the idea of biology as destiny, Oyewumi is committed to the idea, and this is one of her really important points here, that even as these social scientists claim not to study people in terms of their biology or to explain their experiences from their biology, even them having recognized these people as being affected in terms of their biology, they are still doing that same thing of organizing these people and identifying them on that same basis. So in the case of like women or talking about women's subjugation in the West depends upon a recognition of what women are. Or in the case of uh, black people in the United States, Oyewumi is very suspicious of the way in which social scientists are so easy to just use this term black person and it's meant to stand in for all of these people where she's like, this just signals such an emphasis upon biological designation as a way to homogenize people. Even when these social scientists aren't saying that what is happening to these people is because of their biology, they are still falling into the same trap of organizing people according to their bodies. And so much discourse in the West circulates around the concept of the body, where you know, in social science research and psychology or anything like that, you know, you see things like black bodies, white bodies, women's bodies, men's bodies. All of this just reduces people to their status as bodies, where bodies then become texts. They become texts to read what somebody is. And this is partly attributable to the emphasis on sight, on seeing, as a mode of recognition and differentiation. That is, it's then used to differentiate sex, skin color, cranium size, and it is testament to the powers or the power of seeing. Now to be reduced to a body is a European tool of domination. And there's so many examples of this, like in Rwanda, separating people on the basis of their likeness to European facial features, where Rwandans with more thin faces were organized into one group, and then Rwandans who demonstrated other features were not organized into that group, and then this would be used as justification to hierarchize these people. And we can extend this to other things as well. Like if we just think about Laura Mulvey's idea of the male gaze, we know very well about the power of sight in encouraging women to act and dress in certain ways to appeal to the male gaze. Now. I think it's always important to problematize Mulvey a little bit because Mulvey just takes away women's autonomy in being able to choose what they dress like. Like, it's, it's their choice. I mean, let them do whatever they want. But in any case, like, especially looking at popular film and television where women are often uh, written by men, their characters written by men and depicted in ways that is meant to satisfy the male interest or men's interest in them. But even with all of this, we are assuming certain things about what like a woman is, what a man is. How are these people, how are these genders even recognizable? And these are some of the things that Oyewumi is going to encourage us to problematize and think about. So to just return to sociology for a moment, it is often or historically, it has tried to distance itself from biological explanations. And this has been one of the ways that sociology has tried to set itself apart from like psychology where psychology looks at biology, it looks at the physical composition of one's brain, one's experiences, how, that, how they've affected the brain as a determining factor in how people exist in the world, how they think and how they act. Whereas sociology looks at the social factors that affect people and shape them in one way or another. But in doing so, it has, it has effectively erased the way that oppressive embodiment birthed many of the categories it naively locates within the social so instead of locating 
oppression in biology, for example, like how uh, the idea that women are inferior, for example, which was once an idea found among sociologists. Instead, sociology does this thing where it's like it, it recognizes people by organizing them into groups like the underclass, the suburbanites, workers, farmers, voters, citizens, criminals, etc. And these are all bodily designations. This is identifying certain kinds of bodies. Now, if you think, think of a worker, for example, you know, what image comes to mind? Or one of the exercises I like to do uh, with my students to illustrate this is like go to Google or go to another search engine that'll give you images and just type in any of these terms. Type in voter and see what, what images you get. Type in worker and see what images you get. Because within the West, there's a very firm connection between these groups in how they are recognized and the recognition and association with certain kinds of bodies. So another, another thing is like uh, studying poverty, for example, among black Americans, where sociologists might give this a social explanation, but they have still done so by recognizing in Oyewumi's terms, a genetic grouping. And this goes totally unrecognized among these quote unquote scientists, social scientists, whatever. And she calls this body reasoning. This is the biologic and bio reasoning that just seeps into these studies where it's not even interrogated, not even really uh, understood or thought about at all. Now for millennia, women and men have been separated due to biology. Men were given entrance to society's highest echelons while women were relegated to bodily servitude to the home as well. And no surprise that the West would reduce almost everything then to binaries. Binaries are a great tactic to uh, justify exploiting entire portions of the population. But binaries, like, you never go out in nature and find binaries. You don't, you don't find binaries in the woods. Binaries are a product of a certain organizational effort to justify the supremacy of some people over others. But no, no one actually easily fits within a binary. Like if you take the basic uh, cishet normative uh, man woman binary, you, you, we must ask like, what are the attributes that we assign to men that allow us to clump so many disparate different people together under that banner? You know, the Jordan Petersons and those other ding dongs in the world that are very committed to this idea of there being men and there being women. But then they also let slip the idea that there are gradients or degrees of masculinity. Like, you know how there's the alpha male, then there's the beta male and sigma male. I'm very firmly situated within the beta male category. In saying that, they're recognizing that therefore there are, there's a spectrum here. And that this idea of being a man or masculinity is not this homogenous category. Instead, what we have done is we've taken all of these extreme differences between people and imposed a single narrative on them. Nietzsche writes about this in Truth and Lies in a Non-Moral Sense, where Nietzsche writes about the way that as soon as we give language to something, we, in his example, we, we look at a leaf and we give the word leaf to things that grow on trees. And in doing so, that erases all of the distinctions between every single leaf. And each one then is just given the single identity. The same thing Oyumi says applies to something like gender, where the category of like woman is meant to stand in for so many variations between people. And it has such a strong organizing function in this setting too. So in the history of like feminism, if we think about the history of feminism according to the waves, which I know is not a good way to think about the history of feminism because it's American centric, it's white women uh, focused, it's white cis women focused. It doesn't account for so many different experiences of what it means to be women and the many experiences of women fighting against patriarchal power. But if we just for a moment think about one of the elements of what was really considered to be second wave feminism, it 
employed a move away from biological determinism in favor of social construction. So the big camps of thinking about gender in the West have been have believed that either uh, gender is determined by biology or gender is socially constructed. Now, Oyewumi says that in the move from thinking about gender as biological to thinking about it as construction or constructed, Oyewumi says it still relies upon bodies because it's still positing that there is this um, coherence around what a woman is in its or in their in her construction where all women even when we just even when we say it's constructed still says that there is this coherent homogenous category of womanhood and then you have people like judith butler come uh, and say things that like judith butler is like somewhere in between it's not biologically determinant nor is it socially constructed rather it is through the repetitive or the stylistic repetitive instances of gender identity that it comes to take on the status of being natural where for judith butler the problem with social construction theory is that it implies as though gender can just change willy-nilly from day to day or from culture to culture and so on whereas for judith butler through the repetition of gendered attributes they come to be assumed as being natural and come to have a natural affiliation with people's bodies. Now, Oyewumi calls upon Judith Butler, but he kind of has a problem with it in that it still implies this amount of like construction. To say that even gender is performative is to say that in all cases and everywhere, there is this thing called gender where it is being performed. And in doing that implies that Gender is experienced the same way everywhere. There is the same kind of like continuity between bodies and genders in some form or other. When in her context, Oyewumi's context in Yoruba land, or that she's looking at among, among the Yoruba, there is no such concept of gender at all. So it is not performative at all because that society does not organize people based off of gender. And so the very rhetoric about uh, performativity is itself part and parcel of a Western idea about what gender is, not necessarily applicable everywhere else that doesn't organize itself based off of gender, that does not have all of these performative acts of gender that could even be understood through Judith Butler's lens of performativity. But to return just briefly to the discussion of, of social construction, some feminists who, who advocated the idea that gender is socially constructed looked at other contexts and said, look, women over there are, you know, display different attributes. They uh, are, have, occupy different positions in society. They wear different clothes, so on. And then they use this to say that gender being a construction limits women and it, and it it depends on the context that they're in to determine how they can actually exist in the world. And now Oye Wumi's response to that is like, how do you look at another culture or people and identify anyone as being women? Because that assumes that that culture, that that people has a conception of woman, that that conception of woman is actually displayed in the various markers that the white western feminists have identified over there that the white western feminists have the right to look over there and say oh look those are women and that those women over there you know at all resonate that that term of woman actually resonates with them at all so in the yoruba context in southern nigeria gender does not play a part in determining how people are to perform themselves in society in the various social institutions that they occupy. Gender plays very a very small part, if one at all. And instead, the Yoruba emphasize all senses, not so much just vision, as one explanation for this. Because it's not just about, because performativity relies so much, and the idea about it really submits to the Western emphasis upon seeing. Where as soon as you start to factor in other things, other senses, in other contexts, 
like like in the case of the Yoruba, performativity can only go so far in understanding how people are actually going to exist in a given context, let alone their entire histories, which we're going to talk about as well, their languages, their uh, lineages, and so on. So much of the studies and thinking about gender that has gone on in the West have mirrored and really left unexamined many of the oppressions that lie at the heart of the very creation of the categories of gender, where in Oyewumi's words, what you see among these social scientists is not is producing not homogenous social experiences, obviously because they don't want to reduce things to biology, but instead a homogeny of hegemonic forces in identifying as though people can be uh, clumped together in their mutual experiences of oppression. Now, one, one field or one approach that has problematized this and tried to move away from this has been intersectionality, where intersectionality has very much identified that people are comprised of many identities in one. There isn't a single one, and they're worked upon by many different forces that problematize the idea that people can really easily be uh, clumped into single homogenous categories. Now, Kimberly Crenshaw does perform some amount of clumping in the way that she discusses the experiences of black women, but I don't think we need to discount that and you know do away with the 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 fact of black women's uh, oppression within the United States. But in any case, I think that Oye Wumi is encouraging us to go even further and thinking about the way that even this recognition of oppression can sometimes replace the very oppressions that it's trying to undo. And the same can be said about so many other elements about Western society and its effects upon the rest of the world, where even efforts to oppose it have mirrored and replicated those same oppressive tactics. Like, for example, in the case of colonialism, it's, it's incredibly ironic, but it's also uh, an absolute consequence of colonialism itself, that many people who've tried to decolonize have tried to do so by adopting the languages of the colonizer. So just a few weeks ago, I covered uh, Gugi Wan Thiango's uh, Decolonizing the Mind, in which he discusses that a lot, to say that part of the project of decolonization is to remove the colonial language and to remove colonial knowledge systems. And the same here has to apply to this concept of gender. And we're going to talk more as we go on about like the white feminist treatment of other parts of the world and other people's experiences and how white feminists just have historically just transplanted their understanding and experiences of patriarchy onto other parts of the world, which is extremely problematic. But what it does is just repeat these legacies and cycles of colonialism. And then even those people who refuse Eurocentrism often fall back on European tropes like the nation, nationhood, religion, as antidotes to European influence, or the very idea of a race itself. Now, for Oyewumi, in present-day African studies, people are often not required to learn any African languages, but to believe that they can actually understand parts of Africa without knowing uh, any any one of those language and with just knowing European languages and European uh, knowledge systems. For example, like there are no gendered words in Yoruba for like son, daughter, mother, father. There aren't terms for that, uh, which makes it impossible to really translate the language into English and then use English to understand that culture, for example. And yet it is often done. So for example, Oba means ruler. We'll talk about this a lot more as we go on. But the term for ruler, there's another term as well. We're, we're going to get into that. But the term oba is used for ruler, which has been translated into English as king. But when you have a culture like Yoruba that doesn't have gendered language to understand people in the world, that becomes very difficult. Then it becomes very difficult for English-speaking people to actually grasp how that society works with the English language because they don't have the language and the structures of their language 
mirrored in the structures of the societies themselves to actually understand those people's experiences. And that puts us here into chapter two. Re, in brackets, constituting the cosmology and sociocultural institutions of Oyo Yoruba. So before Western colonialism, there weren't really words for men and women in Yoruba, as I think I've already made clear. In Oyeumi's words, rather, the primary principle of social organization was seniority. Now, despite the fact that they didn't have terms for men and women, they did have terms for people based off of their physiology. And this was used for uh, reproduction. So people with vaginas and people, uh, people with penises would be referred to as obinrin and okunrin. I hope I pronounced these things right. Uh, obinrin referring to people with uh, vaginas versus okunrin, people with penises. And unlike English, where female is derivative to male, obinrin and okunrin both include the suffix rin that refers to common humanity. Now, these terms don't hold the same hierarchical weight as the English terms do. Also, these terms refer to adults exclusively and not children. So it's not even like children can be entered into this like gender dynamic from a young age and then socialized into it. These terms are, are really used to describe anatomical differences re relevant for reproduction, and that's about it. But reproduction is then not stylized in the same kind of monogamous, and we're going to talk about polygamy because that's really central to Yoruba culture, in a monogamous type of coupling way. It's just purely about the, the meeting of these two kinds of bodies to produce children. So age and not gender is the primary hierarchical principle. Now, this respectful pronoun for an older person is one, and this is a term that you'd likely hear uh, more often than obinrin or okunrin, where in social settings, you know, but what Oyuumi tells me, and this is one of those things where I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, I just taking what she says to be absolutely representative of these people and the language that they use, but just taking what she says at, uh, at face value, she's saying that you won't really hear the words obinrin or kunrin to refer to people out in the world. You don't see someone and be like, you know, identify their gender and refer to a woman as, uh, as like obinrin, for example. Instead, you might hear someone be referred to as Juan, or you'll hear someone be referred to as uh, the relative place within a lineage, for example. Now, Yoruba does, it has words for mother and father, sort of. Uh, Ia and Baba, but they are also they also refer primarily to age and are used to designate adults simply of reproductive age. And that's the only time they're going to be used, I think, or for the most part. Now, I think, I mean, this when you deal here with like uh, marriage, you within Yoruba, there is a kind of gender dynamic here, but it needs to be <laughs> nuanced very much. So in a, what I will just call a husband-wife dynamic, just to use terms in English that I can use as reference because we don't have terms that translate to what they're referring to here. Uh, in a husband-wife dynamic, the Yoruba used the word oko to refer to the owner of the home, but I believe it could be of any gender. It's just like if there's a marriage and someone ends up moving into the other person's house, whose ever house it is, is the oko, and the aya refers to the person and their family uh, who's moving into that home, who's, who's being welcomed into that home. So I mentioned their family as well because through marriage here, it was treated like you weren't just marrying a single person, but you were marrying that whole family because they would become a part of your life. They'd become a part of the entire marriage unit there. And this would open up entirely new kinds of hierarchies, entirely new kinds of recognitions of people. So for example, if someone had children from a previous marriage, then that marriage ended in divorce, or there's a, a widow or a widower or something or whatever, and they got married again, the new, uh, the, the original children, original, that's problematic, but like the children who are actually first part of that home would be like hierarchized 
higher than the new ones within uh, Yoruba culture. And the, and, the, and the entering members would assume another status, regardless of gender. So Yoruba is primarily uh, cognatic. That refers to uh, people uh, gaining their identity through their lineage. And it's traced through multiple relations, not only through the father, where within the West, and many people <laughs> who are listening who are in the West, chances are you got your, your name, your last name is from your father. It is a patrilineal system. People uh, are recognized in terms of their father's lineage, but not in Yoruba. Instead, it, they have a totally different way of understanding uh, familial relations and parental relations because it includes so much more. So the Aya and their entire family, the people coming into the home, would be seen as marrying the Oko's entire network, the person whose home it is. So marriages are monogamous, but they take on many polygamous qualities, but they're also uh, polygamous at the same time. So couples wouldn't share rooms. Oko or Aya would share rooms with their children if they had their own children or with uh, family members who might need more uh, assistance, might need more constant supervision and surveillance and care. I, it's weird that I call it surveillance. I should just be calling it care. Yoruba often, uh, also often believe that sex during pregnancy is dangerous for the child, and so they abstain from sex. And for this and other reasons, like producing more children, polygamy is not uncommon. So... If there is an, somebody with a penis married to someone with a vagina and the person with a vagina is pregnant in Yoruba, they don't have sex because it is seen as being uh, dangerous for the child, which is actually then encouraged that the person with the penis pursue other sexual relationships with other people. But this is determined almost entirely by the pregnant person. They're calling the shots here and they're permitting this. And it has other uh, important effects and important consequences in that it allows the, the cultivation of even more familial dynamics and people to be part of the family unit, which is beneficial to raising children, to keeping the house, to taking care of uh, sick family members or anyone else who might need help. The more connections, the better. And they would actually encourage... Uh, people to pursue other relationships with people who are younger because younger people uh, are, are because this is how the society is more hierarchized could then take on more of the annoying tasks which I thought was kind of funny but in any case it's like it's it's one justification for that that type of dynamic used to develop more connections to have more family members around to lighten the load for everyone else like it really makes sense and you know, it's, it's when, you, when you compare it to the emphasis upon monogamy within the West, which is often just a tool for patriarchal control over women, in this dynamic, it opens up so many more connections that disrupt one of the primary uh, modes of aggression within the monogamous dynamic, and that is separation. Monogamy works and the violence that's often cultivated through it works by separating women from their social networks, from their friends and their families, and putting them alone in the house with one man. And of course, this is not of course, but this will often breed uh, violence because they are going to be taken away from that network. Whereas a polygamous relationship or dynamic like this encourages so many more types of connections that will permit people to actually have uh, more safety in a lot of in a lot of cases. But it does depend. It's not like I'm not romanticizing polygamy as being the one solution to the harms of monogamy. Definitely not. Now, Yoruba do have a concept of uh, what Oyeumi calls bride wealth that involves the passage of goods from the groom, what I'm just calling the groom, to uh, the bride. And Westerners have interpreted this as buying the marriage, like buying, uh, buying a bride. And of course, that's not the case in, in Yoruba given that it doesn't occur with the same gendered orientations and capitalistic influence. Additionally, researchers conveniently ignore the concept of bride service 
that includes the groom's lifelong obligations to the spouse. Now, it seems as though premarital sex is often discouraged, but there are dynamics where it'll happen, where unmarried people with penises will uh, have sex with uh, married people with vaginas, I should say. And this is a kind of dynamic in itself where, you know, different kinds, you know, just encourages different kinds of connections for different kinds of reasons that cannot be mapped on to Western knowledge systems and Western uh, cultural understandings of romantic relationships and partnerships. And this is called Ale. Now, in, in, as for like uh, gay relationships, Oyuumi writes that homosexuality does not seem to have been an option. Now, I don't know about that, obviously. I have no idea, uh, but I think it's interesting to note, and I think it's interesting to think about and maybe worth problematizing. But it's also something like, I don't think it's possible to apply uh, criticisms of homophobia in the West into different understandings about same-sex relationships and other contexts. I think that these things are incredibly different. But in any case, I think it's interesting, which is kind of all... I feel like I can respond to that. So as for societal labor, like I keep saying, seniority played a more significant role than gender. Lineage would likely determine someone's projected skills. So in war, uh, people who, who were male uh, would co comprise the majority of soldiers, but would accrue their strength and will from the sacred mothers. There were also female soldiers, except with, with the proper word, Obinran soldiers, but they were erased in history, which we'll talk about more in the next chapter. Now, the Western interpretations have largely ignored the role here of the sacred mothers in actually being the source of Okinran's uh, power in, in combat. Now, interestingly, trade was traditionally conducted and I don't know why this is the case, by uh, Obinrin in Yoruba, so females, that's the term that the West would adopt, was primarily conducted by, they, they primarily conducted trade, which is definitely flies in the face of everything uh, we know in the West here, where it's like, you know, females are meant to just stay at home and trade is meant for the mad men type, like whatever that dude's name is of that show, that type of stuff. Uh, so very interesting to see how that is done differently there. But, you know, it feels like a gender dynamic. And one of the difficulties in reading a text like this when Oye Wumi is describing something so fundamentally different to what I know, being a white dude who grew up in Canada, I'm just like always trying to map on my understanding of gender onto this context and be like, oh, well, that's a, that's a gender dynamic that's going on there. But that's not the case because it's an entirely different uh, setting and an entirely different approach to gender where many of people's occupations within Yoruba comes down through their families. So whatever their families were doing is what the children would do regardless of gender. It's just that with trade, it was probably select families, and, but I don't know how it would mostly have fallen upon the Obinrin. In any case, I think it's extremely interesting. Now, when confronting these things, sometimes Western feminists have looked at various contexts, not necessarily the Yoruba, and they look at these different dynamics such as these or other ones and apply their understanding of patriarchal oppression onto these contexts. But of course, that is to totally abstract away from these specific experiences, these specific societies, these specific histories, these specific uh, gendered relations, if I can even call them gendered relations, and just applies the Western gaze on them. And yeah, that's uh, that'll wrap it up. Let's wrap this up here. And then next time we're going to finish off with chapters three, four, and five. Uh, but yeah, if there's anything I got wrong, I don't think I did a very good job in describing this stuff, uh, partly because my head's not working right. I'm a little bit, uh, a little overworked. But in any case, I hope that I was able to deliver something coherent to you. Uh, but yeah, next time we're going to pick up with chapter three and conclude the book here. But yeah, if there's anything I got wrong or anything I've admitted, I'd love to hear about it. And on that note, take care.